So, okay, so we're being, you're all recorded now, you know, not visibly, but orally, <coughs> audibly. So, anyway, so this is, uh, so I'm going to fill you in on DNA as an information carrier, and I'll we'll take the first step with you on how to compare sequences, and we'll, today we'll start comparing pairs of sequences, pairwise sequence analysis. So, first of all, a bit of housekeeping on this course. Hmm. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. it's not the thing, it's the computer. Very good, so get out of this. Ah, the whole computer <coughs> is hanging. Okay, fantastic. Oh, but now, okay. I don't know why, but it goes. Um, so, a few people. The man who frantically was trying to get iMovies up was Jose, you might know him already, but he's there on the, on the screen. Anton will help out a little bit. He's, a, he's an uh, uh, assistant professor uh, in the group. This is me. Here we have Elena, who will help out as a teaching assistant. Siko will do a little bit in the middle of the course for the second assignment. Um, Bas will be around, very much for the third and last assignment. And Doug is a uh, author, but I think now he's an assistant professor in the medical center. He will give you one lecture. And there will be a practical one. Okay. <coughs> this will also be, um, it's also on Canvas, but this is uh, the Outlook. So here are the lectures. So most will be done by me, the edge, and here is Doug. So we're going to give his lecture on November 12th. And here you already see that there are basically three practical assignments which you need to attend. Well, the rules are up on, uh, on Canvas. Um, but you have to, of course, submit a description for each of those assignments, and that will be part of the course, but I'll show you that in a moment. So, yeah, one point of housekeeping. Um, all on Canvas is leading, right? But when there is a message there, and even if here is another date, it's Canvas that will really tell you. So, that is wrong, come and play me, but not before that time. So, if this gets out of date, it's of no concern, right? Okay, so here are the three practical assignments that uh, are part of this course. Um, so, of course, pairwise alignment, we'll start in that today in lectures, and uh, the, the concept of the dynamic programming, I'll start today. Um, then the second lecture is on the, the lecture that Doubt C will give you, and this is on genome alignment, what happens at the genome level, what kind of the, uh, disarray it can get in, and this is also of great relevance to cancer as a disease, the DNA can stick in pieces, will copy itself, and you get some repeats of very, very many pieces, and that has, uh, has functional implications, for example, cancer as a disease. And then the last one is a very general <coughs> framework you can use for modeling, and we'll use it in the concept of uh, doing something in the, in the arena of protein prediction from sequence, and that is hidden Markov models. So there will be two lectures on Markov models and hidden Markov models, and then we'll be priming, <coughs> we hope, for that practical. So this is um, how we'll, um, <coughs> yeah, what we'll do with this course. So it will be at the very end, will be written exam. This will count for half your points. So if you're active, and do your assignments and talk to the TAs and get that, you know, get a good thing you'll submit, then you can sort of by that get half of your points already. So if that is a nine, you can sort of deal with a lesser exam if you wish. Right? Uh, in, in the Netherlands, I don't know how many internationals don't get this yet. You know, we. we very uh, excellent or outstanding or whatever is 10 points and we don't typically go beyond one because that is already considered completely terrible. Zero we normally don't even have to go. We can have one for being there. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, one little rule as well, you know, it's not that everything has to be perfect, but if you completely, you know, if you find out you don't understand anything about the hidden market models, that, you know, that then we can't say you can pass the course. So each of those items for the, you should score a five, right? Okay, so then reading materials, we have the general course book that most of the bioinformaticians have or have, uh, you know, have a copy, whatever, where from, you know, you know, these days you can get stuff of a certain uh, medium, you might say. Uh, that is uh, not allowed to talk any in any greater detail because the new bookstore gets in my back. I had it once. So that's not <laughs> <laughs> it's all stupid detail. Okay. Anyway, 
Okay. Um, so I'm not going there again. Uh, but for each of these books, there are options. And uh, also, this is the, the main course, right? And these guys, I can tell you, they love hidden Markov models. So their glasses, how they look through at the world, they through the hidden mark of everything. So that will be interesting to you, you'll find that. But it's a very good book anyway, as you need to say. But uh, yeah, so and this is quite old. And we, this was selected on two criteria, quality and price. It used to be the cheapest book on the, in, 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 in the area. I'm not sure, I didn't check anymore if that's still the case. But uh, there are these other options. As well. Okay, so uh, everything should be on canvas, taking precedence even. Um, so uh, the, the lectures of 2017 are already there. Every year I sort of update the theme, but normally that's not totally fundamental. So, you know, from these slides you'll have a very good idea of what will be running in each of those lectures. But after each lecture I'll put the updated slides of 2018 in this case, also online. So two important documents, <coughs> schedule taking precedence, the thing I just showed you with the lecture days and the, and the practicals and the deadlines, and then there is something here, and that is uh, rules of engagement. And there, for example, we'll tell you nicely, like, it's okay when you're not there in lectures. It's free world here, but we know that we've measured over, over the years a good correlation between presence and final results. So you take, it's your decision, but we're a bit further on the practicals. It's fine when you take all, you know, when you ask very many questions, but they have to help you. But if you don't show up and then, you know, by the end of the course say, look, now you've got to explain me everything about the first assignment and please explain because you know, it's <coughs> being there and now I want it. That's not good enough. So you give us something by your presence and your activity and we give you all the things that are in our power to do so, right? And there should be a balance there. If that balance is clearly off. We'll say you're for feature right if you're never there, you can feature right to ask questions. If you want to do it on your own, perfect. But then you do it on your own. Right? But that's not the normal model because really every year it shows that everybody is there. Some folks are there. Okay, so these two are no less. Good. So it's all about sequences, and of course, maybe the most fundamental sequence is DNA. DNA has a few advantages that I will show you also in a moment. It's remarkably stable. How do we know? Well, because we uh, dig up, dug up a mammoth that took the DNA and uh, regrew the, element, the, the animal and we have mammoth on the planet again. No, that's not what is happening. That would be great, test, of course. Can you revive all those old creatures? And will they still eat and do things? Um, no, so what they normally do to test these things, if you can't go back into history, how old is this, and what methods did change, what mutations took place, you do something called stress testing. You know, you, you freeze it to death, you know, minus 18, and then you heat it up to 100 over the course of one minute or something. You know, it's nice stuff like that, and if DNA then doesn't crack, you say, well, it's at least stable. If that means it will survive hundreds or millions of years without mutations, we don't know. Well, you shoot it with radiation and all kinds of bad things there, and then you can check. But it's still stress testing stuff that you do over a much shorter time course. Then, of course, the question you have, how long will this stuff remain stable? Okay, anyway, we believe it does. And we know one other molecule that's very much like DNA. <coughs> one little different, right? RNA. And that is a lot less stable. It's one base difference, but it's... But if you look functionally, RNA is not there to become very old. DNA is the template, it should remain there in your cells for 80 years, 100 years, you name it. Some cells are there. Your eye lens, for example, is being made at birth, it remains there. The proteins in your eye lens should not only remain stable, they should be stays translucent, transparent. The lens should be there. And you know, probably disease, all of you, when that doesn't happen anymore at later age normally, cataract, right? Is these proteins going wrong? But not many people suffer from this, so that's remarkable. These are proteins. Some proteins can be remarkable stable. Most are not, but many things. Now, I don't think I need to fill you in on the four bases that are four letters A, C, T, and uh, G, and T alphabetically. And stuff, so here you are, you can read through all of this. And then the DNA typically happens as a, as a double helix, and then a chromosome at a certain phase. It's a double set of DNA molecules, and that for humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. Here they are. This is called, this is history put through on the light microscope. We can do this for over a century. Visualize this. Uh, and there is one sort of interesting one where you see 
that uh, one copy of the of the DNA chromosome is much larger than the other one. This is the, these are the so-called sex chromosomes. So this pair determines the sex of a person. And you might have guessed that goes on that the Y chromosome is a lot smaller than the X chromosome. The X chromosome holds a lot more functionality, a lot more messages than Y. This may be ah, and, and, and ladies have two copies of X typically, and men normally have a copy of X and one of Y. There are all kinds of variations. <coughs> so you have X, Y, Y. Who knows the phenotype? You're a superman. What are you going to do? You become a criminal. So there is a high incidence of that sort of, 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 of type in, in those type of professions. Um, uh, Eastern Germany, they did selection on YXX a while ago. Sorry, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, there was a Y chromosome, and it sort of took. That made these ladies in those days run fast. <coughs> so be, you know, excluded. You can't have that anymore. People should be tested, and they should be chromosomally normal. Okay, anyway. Sex chromosomes. Autosomes, the other 22 pairs are called autosomes. Not determining the sex, do a lot of these things, obviously. Yeah? Um, okay. So, a bit more on DNA. We have a storage problem. You know, the physicists are measuring like mad, and they were always arrogant towards the life scientists. Like, you know, this is all child play, what you do with computers. You run not so much anymore. You store a lot less data. We are, you know, we are the real thing. In the meantime, life sciences have overtaken the physics of things, in, both in terms of how much we calculate and how much we store. The doubling times for um, next for sequencing techniques over the globe is faster than computers grow. Computers double their power every 18 months, which is called Moore's law. So, you know, you can calculate twice as fast globally and store as much stuff twice. The, the, the number of, of gigabytes or petabytes, if you want, if, if you will. Um, um, so, and then you ask yourself, if we have five gigabytes in 2015, 10 to the power 24 bytes, it's a lot of data. All of these walking, all of these measurement signs. How many disks would you need? You think would this fill this room? Probably would. Would it fill the three buildings? I do. Would it all cover Amsterdam? Would it? covered all of the Netherlands. Anyway, hard to answer, depending, of course, on what technology for making disk you have. But at least DNA is quite remarkable because you can store, so the whole of 2015 could theoretically be stored in five grams of DNA. It's not a lot. Now, it's a big, you know, maybe it's this big, but not so big. Five grams of DNA. So a suitcase will do it for you. Everything. So if you can start making technology where you can store and read out at the pace that is feasible, uh, reading is working ever better. Storing means, of course, creating molecules. Right? Writing a disk is creating a DNA molecule. That's more difficult. Steps have been taken. But if we would see this really becoming feasible and see the light of day in a practical fashion, we would never have to destroy any video recording at any corner of the street anymore. I don't think we go to a better world if we have that ability, but anyway, forget privacy, of course. <laughs> Things from the past. But anyway, um, <coughs> that would be a capability, right? And certainly for storing scientific data, it would be a fantastic thing, because nowadays, in most instances in practice nowadays in hospitals, they say, okay, we're going to measure the DNA, we're doing the sequencing, but all the imaging data that is, you know, to get to the final sequence, you throw away too much. It's, it's, it's theorized before you know it. We can't do this at a daily basis over all those questions. And then when there is something wrong later on, hmm, the DNA is funny. It's an experimental or has, has a sequencing error been made. You cannot go back and study the primary data. So you need to do it again. What do you need to do it again? A DNA molecule. So now you get a lot of storage and storing of DNA. Biobanking is coming up. Because we need the availability of DNA molecules. Okay, but it's uh, you know beyond that we want to understand what life is all about and how we can fight diseases and so on. And that's of course a very important question. DNA in itself has some capabilities, so it's 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 a protective molecule. Really. So George Church is one of the uh, the leaders really in sequencing. This guy makes 50 fantastic IDs per day. His lectures are completely messy as a result. Twice heard the lecture and didn't know the difference between the beginning and the end. Anyway, um, but you know, one of the geniuses, I guess. 
And he wrote one of his books really on the DNA stream, including the PDF picture. Okay? So he pulled it up. Okay, so maybe computer science view, but a DNA is basically a molecule that carries a lot of information. We have one certainty in life. Oh, that, yeah, that's the certainty. That's good. We, are, we all started as a single molecule, right? As a, sorry, as a single cell. Fertilized X cell, X cell, right? Fertilized X chromosome cell it was the first cell. And how many <coughs> cells do we have as we sit here, each of us? Anybody an ID? Are you reading that? Okay, give you a few numbers. Would it be a million? Ten million. Oh, I'm getting ambitious. Hundred million. What do you think? A billion. Well, it's 10 trillion, in fact. 10 trillion. That is 10 to the power. That is 10,000 billion cells. And that came out of one cell. Almost all of these cells have DNA. In principle, the same copy. So a lot from this first cell, a lot of cell division has taken place, obviously, to come to these numbers, right? And then we have, as we stand or sit here, we have roughly 250 different tissues. So brain, skin, you know, muscle, heart. And who has heard about a person, you know, so this means everything comes out of one cell, grows into an organism, an elephant, or a human, right? Or a plant. Who has heard of a person who has brain cells in their toes? It's not that somebody stands there, ah, you divide, you, you become, you know, these decisions are being taken. Basically based on the same DNA in each of those cells. So that means DNA, that is a book. The book is read differently at different phases of development, different locations perhaps. And so how does that how does that work? That is basically the big question. We didn't solve it with our bit. We would know no things. We can easily sort of understand then why is it that, that some cells say, you know, we, we divide and we won't be stopped anymore, we divide on, we do this uncontrolled, and we get cancer, right? What is that? Something is read incorrectly in that book. And that is made by entities in the cell that are being formed that will put the cell off track. So there are very, very many checks and balances in living systems. And the fact that maybe this tried in real people to have brain cells in the cells. Maybe that, you know, and then it's, oh, this may be the wrong decision, right? So a lot happens. We have immune system when invaders come in. So there's a lot of error checking and repair. Yes, cells decide at a certain point in time to die because they say, I'm old now, I'm probably not so good anymore. Throw them cell. Yeah, that happens. So, but, but a blueprint of all that that happens afterwards in a cell, you know, a lot of information stored on DNA. And basically, there are a lot of protein molecules that will almost show this is a thing, I shouldn't show this anymore because you're not, you know, a CD nowadays. <coughs> a compact disc is a thing of the past, right? This is maybe the times of an old tape recorder. Who has still a tape recorder playing in his home or your home? Not that you know it from your grandfather, probably, but these things were around earlier on. So the Turing model, the Turing system, was conceived with tape recorders in mind, that it still is a universal model of computation. And then you look at papers that we've written, that this universal model is pretty much, in essence, how DNA operates, how DNA, how that book is run. Only there is not one of these heads that's in the Turing model. There are millions of those heads. And they come and they say, you go away, no I don't, so I can't reach, you know, so it's a whole big fight, say, every split second of who is doing what, reading and using it. That all leads to an organism over 10 billion cells or so that functions, that can talk, can play the violin and so on, right? I think that's amazing, but I don't know what you mean. Anyway, and uh, you know, playing violin runs in the family, yeah? We've considered that also normal. Right? What phenotype is the ability to play the violin? Right? Mm -hmm. something saying it's just hereditary. Well, if your parents are musical, that gives you a greater chance that the child is musical, right? We all agree. What is it? We don't know. There is the musicality gene. Not fun. Okay, anyway, so a bit as a uh, preamble to DNA. So then, as humans, of course, we're the best there is on the planet. We all know this. We are the smartest. We are, I don't know what. So then genomics comes about. So well, where are we now? We, of course, we were certain when the human genome, we will be, have such a long DNA molecule. All the other species will be, you know. And yes, viral genomes, and uh, 
Bacterial genomes, they are of the order of 5,000 base pairs, you know, bacterium 20,000, you know, this is child's play. We were proudly finding, we have roughly 3.3, well, 3.2, 3.3 billion letters, A, C, T, or G, and that's fantastic. But then, an amoeba laughs at us, you know, orders of magnitude larger, the plants of water lily, there are enough, a huge number of, you know, we are just really mediocre here, so in the middle of the pack. So not great. And then people said, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But now, you know, then we win in the number of genes, right? Our DNA, of course, we use much better than everywhere else. So we win on this score. Also, not true. We don't have more genes than other species. So what is it that makes us human? I'll tell you a few stories what people did. But this human-centric view is, um, is uh, doesn't work out. And that was maybe to some a deception, a disappointment. That genomics doesn't underscore the fact that we are the greatest <coughs> on the planet. Unfortunately, well, to some at least, I think it's good fun. But anyway, so um, what have we here? Yeah, so this is about DNA is a string of letters, and here you see it's schematized. Uh, this is about genes, a human gene, um, and so higher organisms. So they fall apart in two kinds: prokaryotes, eukaryotes. And then that's the third group, um, but that's mainly what it is. So this is the higher life form. They read genes. Genes are localized bit of genome. A stretch, it can be two and a half billion letters in all, or a bit shorter. Um, a local, so this sort of a local, so local section of the tape, cut here, cut there, that's a gene. And, but then the reading out the gene can happen in sort of in fragments, because here, of this gene, this example here, you have that the brown bits, really are is, is the bit that is uh, the pieces of information that are used to build a protein. So for a protein coding gene, a gene that is there on the DNA for the purpose of encoding a protein molecule, a protein is also a sequence, not four letters, but 20 letters, folded up in a nice three-dimensional structure, you see that how stuff is read is different across animals and so on. So how the book is read is different. But there are main principles that are shared by all species on this planet. So you say it's a single sort of story with loads of variations, you might say. And so to get all of this stuff going and reading, there are a lot of checks and balances. So all of this stuff in front of this really, in, this contains the information that is used to build what is meant to be built, uh, but uh, as, uh, following and, and preceding that information you have all kinds of things that allow the machinery to say, okay, this bit should now, we need that protein, where is the coding bit of that protein? Let's build the protein now for this. So there are all kinds of mechanisms that, that are there, one of which are little fragments of DNA, there's a specific outlook, and I'll show you one in a moment, uh, that, that is used by that system. So that, I think that, yeah, no, it's not, where is it? Sorry. Hey, I don't know. Sensual thing it is, but it's not there. Um, try one thing for you, maybe it's following. Okay, for some reason it's not in here. I'll stick it in later on. There's a metaphor now. So, one of the things, and a very important signal to find out about how important something might be is what? I would like to hear roughly 80 people shout one word to me. Please. Say it again. Conservation. Ah, thank you. It's not 80, but it was louder. Very good. Conservation. If something is important, it tends to be present in, of course, more copies and more animals and so on. So, but how do we judge conservation? How can we find out, oh, this, this feature, this thing remained the same in all of these species? So that's probably a good idea to have that. You do this by means of comparing those sequences. And all of this course, basically, is about technologies to be able to compare sequences. Okay, so uh, going on then, so this is just a story, I'll, 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 I'll gloss over a little bit. So here's the double-stranded DNA, where all the information basically is stored that is used. Then if you want to get to a protein, we have in our cells roughly well, hard to count, but about 20,000 genes roughly. On average, there might be all the odds <coughs> really people don't know because we, 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 um, we, um, we discover all the time new things but there might be 40,000 different kinds of proteins in the cell. 
from let's make over 200,000, okay. So a lot of these type of molecules, and these are basically the doers in the body, actually. But probably 95% of what happens, proteins have something to do with that. So there is a whole thing called a two-step process to get from a DNA sequence that encodes by means of a gene, a protein coding gene, uh, certain, uh, encodes certain protein, this is the end result, but it goes via a conversion from DNA to messenger, to RNA, messenger RNA, giving the message of what protein should be built, that is called transcription, this step, and this is uh, four letters A, you see four letters here, some of us already know the difference, what letter is different, it's the same thing, it's still four letters, but only a T, I mean, goes into something called uracil. So where is a T here? You'll find a U in RNA, but it makes no difference coding-wise. Same ex expressivity. But then the next step is really from a four-letter code to a 20-letter code, and that is called the translation. <coughs> now, there's something universal about that. That's called the codon table, where just there is the translation table, and it goes in pairs of three from DNA in triples called codons to the single letters that you, don't, you see here, the amino acids, the building blocks of protein, of protein molecules, are encoded in this way, right? Now, you can, if you look at this, you see a few things that might be interesting, that, for example, that there are quite a few amino acids here that are encoded by these triplets, as you can see, at the DNA or RNA level, where you see that the difference in the third position doesn't matter, right? It's still this amino acid that is coded. So if you are CC starting, it doesn't matter what the third letter is. You'll always encode a, a, a protein, one of the 20 amino acids. And there are quite a few here that do that, right? You see that? Or half of them. So, so there is redundancy in the codon, and that is also biologically important because you're more robust. Meaning if a mutation would take place at this position, the system wouldn't sense it. The protein wouldn't, wouldn't sense anything. It would remain the same. Yeah? Synonymous mutations, they're called. So there are all kinds of biological terms. Biologists like to give everything a name, anything on the planet. Mostly difficult names. And then some guys come around to say, yeah, we don't like this name so much, so we call the same thing another name. And you know, then it's really fun, so there's a lot of it. This is called the colon table. The moment people say, oh, we find this happens in, in very many animals, Let's call this the universal coding table. They found out that some bacteria cheat and have another protocol, not vastly different, but in some detail, some codons encode a different protein amino acid. Okay? So this is how you, the, the information is, is, is used to give you a feel. Okay, so what is very important is evolution and Darwinistic evolution. Darwin, of course, is one of the discoverers of these mechanisms or you know, among the first to describe it, um, they talk about divergent evolution. So you have a uh, ancestral species long time ago, a cow horse, and from that, you know, animals uh, developed, and uh, and uh, so it leads to cows and horses and all kinds. So the, the bewildering number of species is, according to some models, a product of divergent evolution, starting at a common origin and then leading to different DNA sequences, you know, being positioned in, in, in different, different uh, individuals from whatever species. What would be the definition of a species, by the way? Is a, is a, is a horse and a mule, is that, is that two species or is that a race? What is it? Well, why do you say? Because if they can get children together, right? But then they shall. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> very good, very good. So, anyway. Of course, an important criterion is can you still mate? Can you produce offspring? That's the main <coughs> barrier. That doesn't happen anymore when we talk about species and other lives may be protected for um, Okay, so, but then in biology, and I can tell you a simple story to, 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 to get a picture. You know, once upon a time, the continent, Latin America, and Africa were together, that's what people think. So there were happy flocks of cows and they were you know, genetically close and had to eat in the grass. It was all nice and peaceful and so on. Then there was the Great Divide. These two continents started floating apart. And maybe in Africa it remained warm. And in Latin America it became very cold, for example. And then, you know, uh, they had um, hairs that were this long. So 
Die hebt me kunnen thuis in het om en om en dan is het uit de stad losing hair, you know. En dan nou, dan de thuis in Latin America, dat is altijd die zo'n picot, so they try to grow longer hairs, and you know, evolution helps, you can, you can do this, you can adapt. And then in modern engineering, we all mix up these cows and we fly cows of America over to, to Africa and let them mate and see what happens and so on. So basically, this is divergent evolution. What you get is long hair, short hair. But think, think this you know, further. You might have that you get traits in each of those descendants of this same DNA, basically, that becomes so different that you get the whole other shape in a new species. Right? Speciation is this called. Okay. Um, and then you know what is needed for evolution, and you know the, the great fun about is you can use computers to find out, because computers you can calculate things first, you can define a system, you can define a generation, you can grow, and you can you can you can mimic you can mimic you know what happens with DNA, how you get children and so on. And if you do that, it turns out that there are four requirements to get to evolution, and. This could happen in life, but it can also happen in writing books or telling stories, right? Memes or genes and things like that. So basically, you need a template. What's the template in life? Well, just to sketch it out to you, this very stable molecule, DNA, right? Where it comes from it. And then what you need for evolution, you need sort of generations. Layer and then the next layer in time and the next layer. And all the time, it's a bit like Chinese whispers. You know, the, the information DNA is passed on to the next generation, right? So, that means you have copying through generations. And in biology, this process is called mitosis, cell division, and, and, and all that stuff. Um, then, and it's a great thing also in learning, in training, you need to learn to make errors because you learn from errors and not from doing something fantastically well and people say, this is awesome. It's also nice when you get it every now and then. That you learn when you make errors, and that's also true. Evolution requires errors. Uh, not so much that you know the, the, the copy of DNA is so different that you know it's unrecognizable anymore, but you need it, you know, you need to provide variation, and then when you have that, you can have selection when there is variation, and there are giraffes with uh, shorter necks, and uh, and the, the leaves are are there, what are these giraffes going to do? They say all these other cows will treat them much better than if you're eating the grass on the floor. So you know what? I see that. So we go on one leg. And you know, eating the high leaves and all the cows can't reach for that, so they're very happy. And then what happens? Those trees become extinct. Ooh, that's a bummer, right? They had it nicely arranged with long necks, so what should they do? They should try and make the neck flexible, and shorten the necks again. Meaning in evolution, adaptation is a continuous process because you adapt to your complete environment. But that's a lot of crosstalk. That environment is you as well. So when something happens in that environment that you interact with that, that sets other rules for how to optimize, how to get better. So yes, it's like computer science, like optimization theory. The only thing is that your objective function, the thing you're striving for, oh, I want to run the fastest or I want to look the best because then the the ladies who mate will like me the most and prefer me, you know. When the lady changes her mind, that one, you know, oh, big and muscular is not, uh, it's not hip anymore, but you and me, and uh, things like that, then it all changes. And so, so it's, uh, it's a very dynamic process. Um, so, this is uh, what it is, and, and you know, we have DNA, we have all of this, but for example, uh, storytelling. Before there were books and the, the, old, the old stories, like, you know, you had fathers and mothers and they were telling the stories to their sons and daughters. And it could be like, you know, if you see a huge animal, you know, with enormous teeth and a very long nose, you know, you go after it, you try and kill it because that gives us food for the whole of winter, right? Good story. And then, uh, you know, the, 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 the son or daughter goes out and sees a big animal, but the story is not uh, clear enough and it's a tiger, also brown and big. And he goes and he tries, and that's not a good idea, right? So the story should also be of quality. Like if you have this big animal, they're fine, but if it's a bit smaller, brown animal, and it uh, runs at you, maybe, maybe run, yeah? Not, don't go, go high, right? And that's the story. And that means that stories get, uh, and, and what happens with stories, typically, that they're told through the generations. They become embellished, let's put it, extended, probably nicer, right? Stronger, more moral in it, I don't know why. So that's a bit of Chinese whispers element, right? So you get error. 
Look at the selection. If it's a story that is there really to maintain life, how to get food, then you get selection, and it's the same system. But what is the what is the template? The story itself. Do you get copying? You bet, that's the storytelling. Do you get errors? Yes, these are these embellishments. And is there selection? Well, some stories you know, make you survive better than, than others, make you prevail better. So it's not an exclusive bio biology thing, but this, this is why this is general. These four requirements will give you a second opinion. And you can look at materia, there you have generation that lasts 20 minutes, so you work for a week, and you see already salt adaptation happening within a week in living organisms. So is there evolution? Yes. yes. Even if something is taken. Now, a bit more on evolution. This is a typical bioinformatics picture, you see many of those. So this is CA standing for common ancestor in computer science. A bit in bioinformatics, we love to use abbreviations to the annoyance of most, but anyway, so CA from now on is uh, common ancestor, okay? And so here you have a descendant X and a descendant G, and maybe you happen to know a lot about this species, whatever it is, or this sequence you have, and you know they all come from the same ancestor. Could that be in any way informative for this molecule or species or what have you, uh, if you don't know much about it? And the answer is yes. And this is the, the most important thing in the room. Because what is happening, there are, uh, in fact, two ways to start changing in a sense. So DNA adapts all the time, and the mechanism is such that the basis that DNA can change. The DNA of your skin cells already changes if you start lying on the beach for too long, right? And, and so you locally you adapt your DNA. You get mutations. Normally they don't matter so much, but some people get skin cancer from that, that's very serious, although immunotherapy nowadays is very successful in skin cancer, so it's become less of a problem, but still don't do it. Um, so there are two ways of, uh, of, of, of ancestry here. What happens is, uh, so you can have these, these are two species, a cow and a horse, and it's a hemoglobin gene, and you say, okay, they somehow come probably the sequence for hemoglobin in this one and that one, all come from a common ancestor, so that means that, that you know you should be able to recognize that history, right? And that's uh, that's what we do. And when you have that relationship, a common origin, you say then that is homologous. These are two homologous sequences. So the only definition that is there is what is homology? Having a common ancestor, and that is yes or no. You cannot be a little bit homologous. If some people try on you, say no, 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 it's incorrect. You're homologous or you're not. Uh, and but then, then that means you have a horse and a, and a cow, and that means then that you could be able, you would be able to find the ability hemoglobin where those two are called orthologous, meaning these two descendants were one gene in the common ancestor. And this is what came, and this has been, and maybe that's quite different because a lot of mutations were accumulated, have accumulated over, over over the evolutionary time period, and that is what you see. Another thing is here is called. Because DNA within us, the copying machines fly all over, so pieces are being copied and put somewhere else in. So it's a very dynamic treatment the DNA molecule gets. It changes, and that means that very often, even certainly across evolutionary times, you get that some gene happens multiple times in the genome. More copies of that. And that also leads you to say that it's redundant, but it has a biological consequence and advantage. So that happens all. When that happens, and this is also of course homologous because this is a, a copy from from this gene, for example, that the same when it just happens. So then there is certainly similarity and this is called parallelism. I would like you to memorize these terms, okay? I used to call them four o'clock moments. I still do this. I wake you up at night at four o'clock or five o'clock and ask you to come here. I won't do anything bad. I just ask you Tell me, homologous, how's that subdivided that you say? Parallelogy and orthology. No, I'm off. Don't do anything else. But this is what you have to be able to do. You have to remember it even while being asleep. Okay, so orthologous genes and parallelogy genes. Both are both forms of homology, and that is the key term. Okay, here you see a little thing to fill you in a bit more. This is just something on global sequences where through the course of history there were three animals, frog, chick, and mouse, that each developed Two copies of the same gene, the alpha copy and the beta copy, right? And this is the data, 
and now you compare all of this, and you, if you get a tree that you know that depicts the relationship, if you get this, then the question is, what is the most likely scenario happening in the past? We weren't there when it happened, but what is the most likely scenario? And then here the story will be first probably you got in an early in the common ancestor you got a gene duplication, this happening early on an alpha beta form, and after that <coughs> the speciation took place, so the subdivision in frog, <coughs> chick, and mouse. Why is that the most likely scenario you think, or would be the other way? First you get the division in three species, and then what should have happened? In each of those three species, that subdivision in alpha and beta should have occurred. Hmm, all in the same way, without checking each other, right? There's life. That's how we often operate. What's the most likely scenario? Give me the information and we will see. Anyway, I guess that's how it is. Now, um, was this story? Yeah, so we have a lot of mutations. <coughs> this is the story. You did it today. You went up, stood in the elevator. Went up to 11, got out. So suppose you would have been a bacteria standing in that elevator. Can they stand? I don't know. Anyway, you are in the end, elevator. Then you come out. You're standing next to your neighbors. You come out. Your DNA has been changed. That's really interesting. Yeah. Bacteria can do it. They can transport pieces of DNA from one, and they've even three main mechanisms to do this: building little tunnels and then, you know, porting DNA through their exchange DNA. This is one of the biggest. This is the most scary story on this planet at the moment because bacterial resistance comes from this fact. If you have resistant bacteria to anything, it takes a moment, and all the other bacteria in the facility gain that resistance as well. And that means that antibiotics need to be developed fast because we're losing it. There are an increasing number of strains we cannot do anything about. And then in this country, give you a nice example. You think about if that's good or not. I'll just tell you the story. In hospitals, there are five antibiotics they keep apart on the shelf. Like if something really strange comes up, something we nothing works anymore, we keep them separate. We administer only those when, when it's really needed, when there's something bad happening. Great. Now, then people do a lot of chicken farming or chicken meat and so on. Chicken industry, routinely, they give those five antibiotics just to, as a precaution to the chick. That means you can bet that the bugs that are in the chick are resistant to that. So we eat chick meat, so what's the story for us? Heat it up with us. Don't eat raw chicken meat. It's very tasty, in this country, at least in this country, very much. Cook it well. I don't want to scare you, but if you tonight eat some. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so. Uh, but that is, that is called uh, vertical transfer. This is something else. Eh? Normally we pass on DNA through the generations. That's called vertical because we try to write it down here. Granddad, children, grandchildren, and so on, from top to bottom. This is therefore called uh, even, uh, horizontal gene transfer or natural gene transfer because it goes. At a certain point, it passed from one bacteria to another, regardless of what sort of generation it is. And uh, so, how can you trace this with these formalisms? If this happens, <coughs> the DNA gets disturbed. You have perfect lineages, like you know, mutations coming in slowly, you see them coming into the gen, and at once you see something very strange happening. Ooh, this whole section of DNA is completely different. What happened? Maybe something else. Okay? Oh, here is, uh, for these copies, there's this picture again, this situation here. How could this, this be advantageous? Why, why are these mechanisms being evolved that, that, that facilitate them? Let's hear. Suppose you have a gene, very important gene. In Darwin speak, selection is high. If a mutation occurs that, you know, makes this protein not function anymore, you're dead. That's not good for the preservation of the gene. So, this, there is a lot of selection, like, you know, mutations don't happen. Now, suppose at this time, moment, at this moment here, we get a second copy. It's a gene, it's functional. So now you have two pieces of DNA, two positions where a good molecule can be built. What now? Then the evolution of molecules, oh, that means there's no more leeway, right? One of those copies can say, you know what? I'm going to mutate, I'm going to try something else. Because the other one says, okay, that's fine then, because I'll do the function, right? The old function. Now, that's all fine and well, so you see then if this happens, if Darwin speak again, selection pressure is a lot lower because, you know, one of the two can start experimenting. 
But then suppose you don't to do all great things and you grow hairs as a result of other growth. And, but then, you know, it's, when it loses the ability to perform the old function, then all the pressure, of course, is back on the, on the original guy, right? So you see that if, you know, depending on how much it uh, fades away or, or drifts away, becomes different, not being able to do the old function anymore, you see that selection pressure. In the end, it's restored again. But then, as a product, you have something new. Hey, and if that is good, so it gives evolution a boost. So a lot of people view this redundancy, <coughs> virology, as one of the main mechanisms to facilitate, to allow the sandbox to play for organisms to attack. Okay? This is here the duplication event if you want to use that. Parallelogy. Good. Now, what can all happen in sequences? I just drank a big coffee. I'll flash it from slide past you, you can read up. So, biologists give, as I said, likes to give names to things. So here at the DNA level, these are the chemical formulae, the chemical structures of these four different bases. There are two forms in that two belong to purines and two belong to pyrimidines. I have sort of the thing that helped me a while ago in what is what. So the pyrimidine is the longer word and it's the smaller word. See that? Remember this the right way around, otherwise it won't happen. Anyway, that was for me. I don't know if it will work. Anyway, so you can have transitions. These are the harmless. So if you stay a purine, you go to another letter, but you're still a purine or a pyrimidine. And if you hop over to the other party, uh, so you go from side to something like here, then you talk about a transition. Just so you know. Another thing is biologically a bit more relevant, you might say. This is talking about a gene that DNA encodes a protein, and now a mutation occurs. The question is, will that lead to a change at the protein level? The protein is the doer, so that will be meaningful. So there are two types of, and I showed you this codon table, remember, where I even said this third letter sometimes doesn't matter. If you have a mutation there, that is called a synonymous mutation, not leading to a change at the amino acid at the protein level. The non-synonymous mutation that does lead to a change at the amino acid, and if you talk about this, then there are two ways. Uh, I should have shown you, I don't know how long it will take, but I'll try it again. <coughs> ah, you know, it's not too bad. Okay, here you go. There are uh, three very um, strange amino acids. Who sees them? I'm going to call it stop. Really? Not an amino acid. Stop means that the science stop here. So read on, make a protein, translate, translate here at the end of the book, one of the proteins, for that matter. That's the coding. So let's say this is 64 places to be given, right? So if you agree with me, let's say 3 out of 20. So you expect randomly that 3 out of 64 is roughly 1 in 20. It should be a stop coding, randomly. That you expect out of all of this. And that means that's interesting. So it means when you get a random mutation that does something to the protein, chances are that you get an early stop codon. That was not the ID. The protein would should have run until there. So now the mutation leads to this code, each of these three, and that means it stops there. So as a result, you would get a truncated protein, a shorter protein than would be um, than was the original ID. Yeah. So. Now back to the table again, here we are. So there are two ways, so a mutation that leads to another amino acid, from a, a tryptophan to a glycine or something, uh, and a nonsense mutation. Yeah, is it nonsense? It means, you know, you have an amino acid that will be changed by means of the mutation into a stop. And that means it stops there. So maybe it was uh, amino acid number 10 in a protein of 500 long, if that turns into a stop code, the system will say, okay, now I make a 10 long protein because the end of the enzyme is there. Okay? So that can be dramatic. The stop code. Okay, now some other tricks that DNA is playing. And mutations can can bring about. We are, I'm sorry to tell you, big stopperers when it comes to our genomes. Roughly half, if not 60% of our genome 
is repetitious. It can be repeats of three letters, P A T A T A T A T A forty thousand times, something like that. No, uh, or or longer, hundred monks pieces. Sometimes it's even longer, and then it's uh, you know next to one another, and then a long time nothing, and then the stutter starts again. You know stuff like that. So the first repeats. So many possibilities. Now, if I flash a few past you, this is at the protein level, and sometimes you know. You can see how biology and evolution is not all the time inventing this stuff, <coughs> it is recombining stuff. Here is an example. In this protein's three-dimensional structure, uh, there is a sequence. It runs like this. Yeah, it runs probably here somewhere. This is the beginning. Who sees the end? You don't have a close look in your home. But what's the picture? And you can see it. Um, you see here that there are, structurally, you can see that there are repeats, right? This is like a propeller, right? And each of the banners here. Um, the blades, I should say, is, um, is, is indeed a repeat structure. So this is, these are repeating fragments of sequence that each then fold into the same piece of structure and together, let me see how many are there, we have 11 now, so this is 9 or 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six. this is a 7 bladed propeller, there are 11 ones, so they are the dominant even. Um, so that's interesting, so that means that if it was the case that this was the beginning bit of sequence, it's being repeated, it's being stuttered, right? It's being now seven times put in that thing on that structure. This is not doing sky. Okay, so you have all, uh, biologists again giving names to almost everything, right? So you have micro and mini satellites, and there is a definition. Micro satellites are until three letters long. In one one. And mini satellites are from three or from four to a hundred. Then I don't really talk about satellites. Or, no, I, I don't. Then they don't talk about it anymore. So there are variable number, you know, so all kinds of stuff. And uh, so this is uh, here, you have at the DNA level all kinds of stuff. So all kinds of stories, read that at home. If you repeat, so basically, how, you know, there's DNA to uh, technology now used in the courtroom even. How do we identify people based on the DNA still? It's not sequencing the whole DNA and then you have it. No, it's a little bit of DNA, but it's about a variable number, tandem repeats, VNTRs according to biologists. How many copies you have is quite individual. And that allows the judge to say you have been there with a chance of p-value 10 to the minus 14, right? And then you can still say, it wasn't me. Sorry, 10 to the minus 14. There you go, statistics speak. And uh, so that's based upon things that you can even see on the microscope. These repeats give a certain picture you can see on the microscope. So it's not so high tech, and that's why it's in place for quite, quite some years. Yeah? Okay, so all kinds of other types of repeats. This is just to show you, in fact, the copying machine is there. So there is, there is a mechanism to just copy this and put it somewhere else, in, and that is uh, to be called this transposons. These are bits of proteins that do the copying, and what you'll have here is uh, things are added on to the local piece of DNA. This is the blue is the real gene, and by means of doing this and that, adding that to it, uh, you get that this is now primed for copying, and then copy happens. Yeah. So just to show you, you know, you can read more if you want. That you know mechanisms to stutter means you need a device that makes you stutter. That is provided. And here you see, uh, well, you know, what, what, uh, so on, at the, the, the more detailed level, what you need, what letters you need. And there you see again that the information in DNA is very, very important. What type of letters do you have for what? It's very important to get an activity back, yeah? Including making proteins, making what form of the protein, alternative splicing. There's a lot that's happening, all based on the information in DNA. And that is why you should not drink too much alcohol, should not smoke, should not run the beach so much, because the mutations do matter, right? They might interfere with that machinery. Okay, uh, read this at home. Byron McClintock was the first one, you know, jumping genes. It was flower power times, you know, everybody dancing and jumping, so there you go. <laughs> Even in science, people took note. Um, and, you know, tricks to copy and paste. So this is... Uh, Copy and paste, you might say. Huh? So, just for example. So, copy and paste what happens at the DNA. 
All right, so this is also a home reading, so let's uh, show me the slides. I'll do that for you. <coughs> yeah, another one. At the protein level, a couple of debilitating diseases, bad diseases, neuronal diseases. Huntington is especially bad because people don't get over 40 much if you have this. And then, you know, the, the, the main shared reason, cause of these type of diseases are stoppers at the level of a single amino acid in the protein. Normally the letter Q, glutamine, and uh, it's one of the 20 amino acids. And then sometimes, you know, until sort of 20, so you get protein sequence and then you get Q, 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 meaning an amino acid you repeat. If it's 20, no problem. If it's 25 available, if 40, big problem. Forget this disease. So just the length in the protein of that letter, it just you know causes the disease. Structurally, what happens is this protein is normally these letters, you know, the protein does know to build it in. It gets sort of a little flat at the outside, and then all the proteins have such a flat tool, and then they say, let's get together. You've got an agglutinated massive protein that should have been functional. You get a big blob. And the normally in your brain, which is also a cause of, uh, of Alzheimer's, is that these cells die. If you lose the functionality of these cells on whole this, you can just do a scan in the brain. People with Alzheimer's get literally holes in their brain. Yeah? And so a lot of this, this physical cause at the protein level. Yeah? Okay, so here you get the sense of why you're here in this course a little bit, what technicalities. Here you see in the schematic way to represent repeats. The idea is this one here is a given repeat, roughly 50 volts. So you see five incarnations, if you like, of the repeat, then nothing, and then one, and then three more copies, and then at the very end of this protein, it's a big protein, nearly 2,500 amino acids. Normal protein sizes are 300, 500, hemoglobin, an important one is 150. This is a big one. The largest one on the planet is called Titan. It's roughly 30,000 amino acids. <coughs> that's a protein that's in the muscle. Okay. That's a structural reason for being there. Anyway, this is repeat type 1, but it can be nasty. At the same time, you have a repeat type 2. Well, it's not stopping so much at the protein level. It's only two copies of it. But then we have repeat type 3 here, occurring here and here and here and here. And here something happened, maybe a mutation that is not recognized as another copy anymore. And then one again. And here you see that the, the shading is different. And these are so-called uh, alternative splicing forms leading to a different protein. But some letters are different that make it another copy. Anyway, so three repeat types in the protein sequence, these are uh, these are, uh, you know, leading to alternative splicing. The idea was this is only for the first repeat type. What people have done here, they've taken this bit of sequence and that bit of sequence, where we know that the repeats are, and these ones line them up. The idea is once upon a time. These copies were all exact copies of a thing in the beginning. So in the beginning, all of these, how many are there, you count, were all exactly the same. Look at it now. Nowadays, it is all different. What is black means conserved, the same letter. No need to read it. So look what happens. You see these, these dots here? That means there is nothing there if you compare it to this, this sequence. So you don't need to understand the alignment. If you only see, ooh, this is not, <coughs> what would, how would the block have looked if all of these sequences would have been identical? Just, of course, all these sequences nicely under one another. Well, that's not the case anymore, right? This is considerable, and that happens in proteins. And who, what encodes <coughs> the protein? The DNA. So at the DNA level, this is happening, okay? And we, we look at it from the protein perspective because that is closer to the function, okay? So basically, this is maybe a sad story, but you know we earn our money as bioinformaticians based on this, so it's also very positive. It would have been great if you know we um, have a gene, somebody comes with a piece of DNA and says, you know, can you look at it by bioinformaticians? Sure, sure, I run a few programs, I look at it, and you say, oh, it's a clearly a protein coding gene. You know what? Is it a protein? Here is the three-dimensional structure of this protein. What mutation are you worried about? Well, don't worry. Oh, if you have that, then the cell will start dividing, you get cancer, but be very careful. Like on first principles, understanding the physics. A protein is a sequence, and the rule is, if a certain sequence falls in a certain structure, it's physics. Check the forces, the pellet, whatever, explosive forces, and so on. Uh, sometimes this goes wrong, the physics sometimes doesn't know what to do. Um, 
uh, countesies, do you remember that? Prime proteins are misfolding proteins, which is kind of reacting on the environment. Um, basically, that is happening. So that means we should be able in time, when you have a sequence, you can predict, say, the protein structure, and if you have the protein structure, you know the active site of the protein, where it's doing, what it's doing, and you can say, oh, that is a function. This would be great when you can do it. But currently, we're not good at this. So the, the physical approach, first principles, doesn't work so well. Okay, we can start predicting a couple of structures and, and some functions we do well, but basically, no. So this is biomechanics. If it doesn't go in the forward direction, okay, we do it in the, in the first direction. Luckily, a lot of people have put a lot of information in databases, diligently, a huge databases about DNA sequences protein sequence of protein structure even, we use that information and we compare and we say, oh, this looks like evolution related. So what we know from one, we can sort of transfer onto the other. We can learn by comparing. The comparative analysis. Darwin, again, was the first who really made that into a significant conclusion. Comparative analysis, learn from that. So reasoning back, knowledge based. We compare based on known facts, so you say, what relationship has my entity with that known fact? And if that, known, and if that relationship is close enough, you say, okay, then I think this known fact also plays a role. That's basically what we do. That's all about friends. You can go home now. That's the principle. The essence. Of course, oh, right? Uh, now, think of technicality if later on we use this, this ground principle. But that is what it is. Okay, and then, you know, in practice, if databases are so important, what have you been? Have you, We've been measuring over time. Sequencing projects are now come of age. It's very easy to, to, to you know, a human is four hours of uh, sequencing work and you have another genome of a patient. Oh, great. That was very slow earlier on. So that means, you know, sequencing data. Sequence data is accumulating fast. But the other stuff, like, you know, how's the structure? We need to do X-ray or NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. It's the molecular equivalent of fMRI in the, in the hospital. You know, a lot of work, so that goes slower. So that data, there's, there's, there's fewer data on that. So sequence data, hell of a lot. In comparison, structural data, protein level, or these are functional data, that's even harder to measure. How do we do this in biologists? Well, we just always do it. Uh, how does this work? You know, you destroy it, then you look, does this have a consequence, right? And is the engine important? In a car, what do you do? You demolish it or take it out, and then you say, can I still drive? No, I don't drive. Ah, the engine is important. That sort of reason. We do that a lot. So this means that, you know, but that is difficult. So measuring function is even more difficult. So in the London tube, you see this minor gap. And here, this refers to the gap between sequence data and structural function data, right? It's a lot less. And that means comparing stuff at the sequence level, there's so much of it. There's Overriding the important, and that's why you're in this course. Because we do that in this course. Now, having said that, let's get a quick start of doing that. If you feel, and then you go to practical and you work it out on paper. See, if for some it's just revisiting, for some it's new. Um, but uh, so basically, we're all now about how can we compare sequences yeah. under the model? Was there a question? I heard sound of. No? Okay, so uh, it was a. Uh, a sequence that might should come from a common ancestor, a model of sequences, how much did they change since t equals zero, right? And that is what you call alignment. So here you see you know, two alignments. So this sequence might be aligned like this, or like that, is it all the time the same sequence, or like this, but this is not really an alignment. You see that nothing is fitted onto one another. You can see that here. These minus signs are not amino acids or nucleotides here, they're placeholders to get sequences in registers so that you can write on top of one another. Here, no gap is needed, no minus sign is needed, because it's three on three, and then that's what it is. Okay, so, some sequence databases at the nucleotide, at the DNA level, and there is far more, and there is also a lot at the protein level, all kinds of databases, you know, all these groups are, you know, if you sequence that, we do this, and so on, and so it's a lot of talking. Between all of these groups across continents, so that happens, and uh, you know, but there is a lot. So here we have two alignments. Um, oh, we did. Uh, there's 
not my slides. You can see that the time <laughs> cannot possibly be my slide. I have another word in this, but my family name turns out to be the funny letters of broken secrets. You can see it. Even an, uh, an annotation is there. You know, we like to annotate the problem. There you go. Anyway, so you can see that alignments at the DNA level are a bit more boring. And at the protein <coughs> level, obviously, some people take pleasure by connecting a protein sequence to the Oxford Dictionary and find the longest English word in the sequence. You know, you have 20 letters to use. Champagne was the champion for a while. I like champagne. You can write the protein letters. Then, of course, the question is, would this really fall in nature? I don't know. Anyway, so a lot of fun you can do. And nothing to do with biology, of course. <laughs> anyway, it's fun too. Um, so, uh, and, and here you see this asterisk. What do they mean here? Can anybody infer from where they're placed what it means in asterisk? That word again came from there somewhere. Conservation. And that means when there is not an asterisk, apparently there is a mutation, right? Something is different. And a lot of alignments look like this. Little conservation. And sometimes it can be, yeah, it's still doing the same thing because these amino acids are there to provide its function. That's the active side there. So although it's totally different, they still do the same. Ballpark figure, you can change half the letters in the protein sequence. The protein will still do the same thing. You have to know, of course, what it is. Because you shouldn't meddle with the amino acids that, that, that facilitate the active side or the functional side. Yeah? Um, so, if you talk about similarity, um, if you talk about similarity, oops, sorry, to speed up, uh, you, can, you can compare sequences based on all kinds of things, but in this course, we'll do sequence development. Now, let's go quickly, this I'll do later, you can read it, That's because I want to give you a feel, okay, so let's do this. These are the changes you can expect to happen in sequences. Here's the point mutation, a single letter <coughs> changing. Point mutation. Another one. Oh, frame shift mutation. That means that you get a mutation. Can you see where it starts? Here. And although there is just a letter in between, you see that the register, the three, the translation will become totally different. Speed up a bit on this. This is called a frame shift. It means the sequence, because there is a letter coming between, will now produce a totally different protein. Although there's hardly a change in the DNA. Okay, another one. A deletion. Well, that's an easy one. There's something falling out. You know, one compared to the other, obviously. And what is a deletion in the one direction would be an insertion in the other, of course. So there you go. There's probably this one. Here's an insertion. So probably this here is an insertion. Strange element here. See it totally off. This is this unexpected stuff, right? That I mentioned to you. This might be horizontal transfer. Like, oh, the letters, you know, you expect this, and now we have something very strange. What does that mean in this, in the meaning of this? Right? Maybe there is something. Uh, inversion can happen too. That means you read it from the other way around. That happens at the DNA level. And then there are other mutations that do not change the protein or the thing that is made but how much of it is made, okay? It's another type of mutation that will interfere with, with the process of making these entities. Now, uh, I should draw to a close a little bit. This is um, what can happen, all kinds of mutations. Okay, we have what is again the drama in biology, common ancestors, very nice, but very important. Normally they became extinct. Extinct. We don't have them anymore. That means we have the problem of uh, having uh, this is for a certain position in alignment, let's say this position, where we find in, in two sequences we have nowadays that at the one position there is a G in the one sequence and a C in the other. Now we start reasoning. What happened? Occam's razor, minimal model. You might say, okay, if this happens, that probably one was in the original, so there is one mutation. That could be a model, like here. This is probably a mutation, and in this, you know, Given that it would have been a G in the common ancestor, this is conserved, and this is mutated. So this slide shows you, here you will do the same reasoning. If I find A and C, oh, that would mean that maybe the A is the ancestral letter, one mutation, you would be wrong here. So all, the slide shows you, but then 
apply models, there you would say, what would you say here is an innocent biologist? Two A's, what does that mean? Conservation. Not true. There's two mutations. It can happen, right? And this is a famous biology thing, the so-called back mutation. G going in A, <coughs> going in G, going in T, going in whatever, and after five million years, you know, it's back at square one, and uh, being a G again. And we would think if you see this G, G, nothing happened, a conservation. No, a lot happened. Right? So this is models and reality. Okay, this is an important thing. Um, this is shows you about common ancestry under the Darwinian evolution. Basically, there is one very important sentence I would like to be able to wake you up on. Let's say three o'clock in the morning. And I say, what, what, what was this relationship in evolution between structure and sequence? And then you all yell, okay, yeah. structure more concerned with sequence, meaning hemoglobin is a mentioned it to some during the break, is a protein we all have. It's better because it, it transports the oxygen for bacteria through the muscles, very important, and taking uh, CO2 back. But anyway, it happens in dogs, it happens in horses, it happens everywhere, close species that are close to us, and still the sequence can be 90% different, 10% the same. Very different sequence. If you look at the structures of those proteins, they're all spot on, the same. Meaning, you can vary the sequence quite a lot, <coughs> but oftentimes the structure and the result of that will remain the same for different sequences. Okay? Structure more productive sequence. If that is true, you can have that two sequences are the descendants of some common ancestors. <coughs> they become very different, 90% different or so, for, for hemoglobin, for example. Still, the structures can be the same, and as a result of that, their functions can still be the same. Sequences can start becoming can become very different, <coughs> but the, 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 what is encoded, structure and function, remains the same. So that means if this is this is the model and, and what is now happening, what are we going to do? Suppose we have a known sequence here, we know the structure and the function. The biologist comes in and tells you uh, I have a sequence here. Can you check whether that is uh, whether I should work on it? Is it important? What is it? You compare it with all of these sequences using the technology you will learn in this course. Uh, then you say, oh, I think there's a similarity between these sequences. Oh, then I, what I guess will be they are homologous, they have a common ancestor. And then, <coughs> under this scenario, say, but then it's likely that the function of your unknown guy is the same as the one you know. Basically, that's what you get as a nice bonus. You do your comparison. If you are daring enough to say, I think there's one of you here, then you can transfer all you know about the one to the other. That's the trick. No experiments, just running some computer programs, right? So this is again about uh, warning you about the uh, uh, homology. I go on. I'll skip this for now. We'll come back later. A few other, let's see what's <coughs> relevant to evolution. We go to evolution. Where is my... Sorry. Um, yeah, this one, I'll show you. Okay, sorry, not this. So, question to you. Now we were there during T0. This is the common ancestor, we know it, we were there. Now, a few million years later, you get two descending sequences, two descendants. This sequence, ACCD, we were there, we know exactly what happened. What happened? If you compare this to that, the B turned into a C. You see that? This mutation happened, B to C. What happened with this sequence? Something dramatic, we call that a deletion. What was deleted? The letter C is <coughs> not to be found anymore. Now we have the normal situation. Unfortunately, in the most cases, the common ancestor is unknown anymore, it became extinct, it's not there. So from what we have, comparing these two sequences, we should guess what happened in evolution. My question to you is, is it this scenario? So, we start reasoning a little bit, yeah? So both sequences to start with an A and end with a D. Let's say, you know what? That's probably conserved. You write that in your line at the top, by the way. So the question is, what do we do with CC and B as a letter? This or that? What is the truth? Which scenario? Left or right? Left, you're so good. Computer agrees. Great, okay. So that's done then, now you understand alignment, it's very good, so now we can quickly go to it. Um, okay, 
few things and then we stop. We do most of the tuning of practical labels. Um, so basically, a holding number is three, as you might know, and seven, but here we talk about three a lot. There are three types of alignment. You'll get that on paper in a moment. Global, local, and semi-global. Um, there are also three different ways in how you can put these minus signs in these placeholders. They're called gaps. And aligning means you do a mathematical trick. You say if, if letters become the same, they stay the same, then I get points. And if letters become different, I take points away. <coughs> and if I need to insert a minus sign a placeholder, that takes points away. And overall, you calculate something and get the best scoring combination of two sequences. And that's called an alignment. Now, there are three penalties in here is how they, how they, how they do it. I'll show you uh, next time. And in the practical, they will be clarified to you. <coughs> to give points, we have tables. Here, yeah, this is for DNA. This is a simple table. What does this do to you? You say if two letters are the same, you give one point. And if, and if a letter is different, you take a point away. So you have an alignment, you can score it. This is a more realistic table. And you can see mathematicians already hate this stuff, you know why? This is a similarity table. But the letter A is less like itself, according to this table, and the letter C is like itself. You see that? It's 100 person 91. Mathematicians can't deal with this. The same is the same in their book, right? The others just say, ah, oh, we don't care. It's just, you know, another way of saying it. Right? So that's what we did. Um, so let's give you a feel. This is the real one of the real tables in. Um, what we use to, to, to align protein sequences. <coughs> two minus of amino acids that are not so similar. Amino acids that are similar on the diagonal, you have the self scores, A on A and C on C and so on. <coughs> and, um, ah, yeah, this is, an, this is an old table. We know now that the T is incorrect. There's a whole point they can make of this. We still use this table because people are used to this, okay? We know it's not okay anymore, but still we're used to the error. Let's keep it in. Not good scientifically. Here you see another table, the most widely used one, by the way, lots of 52. And here you see it arranged in blocks of amino acids that are similar. Okay. Now, this slide shows you, I'm going big because I want to show you the one picture so you can go into the practical. Uh, the number of possible alignments, how you can arrange an alignment, two sequences of 100 long. Give you basically of 300, 10 to the power 88 different alignments. <coughs> so if you can calculate them all, pick, do them all, pick the best, impossible. Also here, for thousands, <coughs> impossible to compare them. Okay, so now I'll give you a feel and the rest will follow. The game is as follows this is how an alignment works. You have two sequences you want to align, you write them like this on the table, and an alignment is equivalent to a certain path through that matrix. So if you have 100 sequences here, 100 sequences there, how many cells are there in the matrix? 100 squares and 1,000, right? How many possible pairs you think there are? Sorry, how many possible pathways you think there are in astronomical matrix? Yeah? We do it in a simple way. Basically, the rule is you can, do, you can step through this matrix in three ways. Right? Down, diagonally. These are the rules, okay? That means if you are in a cell, you can get there in three possible ways, from the top, diagonally, and from the bottom, okay? We use that in alignment. These are the rules, so you discuss that during your... So basically, I'll give you now an example, three sequences. Here we go. DAG. We have a very simple scoring scheme. We get one point when it's the same. Uh, and the gap will be two points off. So basically, <coughs> do this in your, doing your practical, you fill in these tables using rules. You get this. You follow the rules. In the practical, it will come up. And depending on what alignment you do, the, the, the real result will be these two sequences will, in the end, score two points at their alignment. During the practical, this will become clear because we really have to sort of stop the people outside. <coughs> okay, anyway, do that during a practical. By the way, that's important to know. Yes, practical one is computing. You will create your own program to do alignment. 
So make sure you understand the steps. Practical two is using software in genomics. Practical three is programming your own hidden marker models. You have code scaffolds, don't worry, we help you. So two are programs, right? And you use it for that. Okay.